All right, welcome back. We are game 3001. That is in the winter 2020 semester at uh, George Brown. It's week five, part one of our broadcast. We're going to be talking about intro to pathfinding. All right, so the first thing I've asked you guys to do is uh, download the new template. So I put up a template up on uh, a Blackboard. So let's go to Blackboard. Under Labs, under week five, there is a new template called uh, STL template version five. Please download that. And if I was to do that, I already have it here. I'm just going to extract it. There it is. I don't need this anymore. And what I want to do is I want to put this template in just in our little folder I'm using. Rename this thing to game 3001, winter 2020, and it's lesson 5D. Again, I always, I always record during your section, so I'm going to double click and launch this thing. And again, a couple things we need to do. What's the first thing I should do when I get my template? Retarget. Yay. Retarget your solution. Um, and that's the first thing we'll, we're going to do. We're going to retarget the solution together. And then the next thing we're going to do after we retarget is make sure the build configuration is correct. So the stuff you see up here, debug and x86, that looks right. So we're good to go. Okay, then third thing is run it and see what we get. So when we run it and see what we get, we get a bit of a build process. You can see it's building down here. And then we should have our, our template come up. One day. Yay, a little ship pops up. So we know that's working. Excellent. All right, so that is, um, that is our template. So that's the first thing I wanted you guys to do. Next, on a Blackboard, under Assignments, I have details for assignment number two. However, I want to start with some questions around assignment number one. Some questions I've received lately are, hey Tom, can I do seeking, arrival, obstacle, avoidance, and fleeing all at once? The answer is no, don't do that. Follow the instructions. It says clearly, when the user presses the number one, a target will appear somewhere on the screen. That means if you press one again, it'll reappear somewhere on the screen. It'll reposition itself to some start position on the screen, like a start point. Make a start point for this little simulation, right? This could be random or not, a ship or some vehicle or whatever, right? And then it will enter the screen from one of the edges. That means that it's going to come in from the outside of the screen, right? And it's going to use the seeking algorithm that we made together and maybe one that you work nicely, it works nicely for you, someone that, uh, a seek algorithm that kind of looks where it's going um, and all that kind of stuff. That's seeking. We kind of did most of that together. Arrival. Um, when you press the two button, the same target and, uh, and vehicle will appear on the scene. It's going to reappear on the scene again. It's not going to be the same thing. I'm not going to continue the simulation. This is simulation number two, which is, which is arrival. So you're going to reset everything again, back to outside the screen or whatever. And then obstacle avoidance. That's another simulation. So the target and the ship, and there's going to be an obstacle. And then the final thing is fleeing. There'll be the target and the ship, but notice in this fleeing that they're fairly close to each other. That it's going to start fairly close to each other so that the ship will flee away from the target. Okay? So I wanted to answer that because um, some of you have asked, well, can I make it one big scene? And the answer is no. Please don't do that. However, if you wanted to use multiple scenes, as in the stuff we're going to be talking about today, that's a different thing. Uh, one question I had today was, can I use template five? The new template I just gave you today. Okay. You have, to, you have to kind of mash template four and template five together to make it all work. But if you're happy doing that, all the power to you, right? Let's talk about the new one. So the new assignment, it looks like this. You're working alone again or with a partner, so up to two people. You're going to use the template provided in class or your own. However, I recommend the template provided in class. You must have a grid and tile system or something like it. For example, if you don't want to use grids and tiles and you want to use waypoints, or nodes, I'm okay with that, okay? Um, I think grids and tiles are easier, but it's up to you. Ensure you select an appropriate seeker sprite. So this could be a ship or car or whatever. 
and the seeker will be able to navigate the tiles only by moving right, left, up, or down. So no diagonal movement. So when you're seeking around, you can't do any kind of movement. And you're not using um, steering behavior here. You're just using moving up, down, left, and right. Okay, three, create an interesting map. This could be a bit creative. Ensure the map includes obstacles. It could be mountains, walls, debris, whatever, zombies, that are impassable. Ren rem you know, render or draw these sprites associated with your map tiles, right? And you may use the, a tile set or, s or simply just draw your obstacle sprites. Example, you have a white screen and you only draw mountains. So that, that's your obstacles. So you want to go there, right? Um, and you could also use a tool. There's a tool that's out there you can learn how to use called Tiled, right? And Tiled, if you're making a game that uses tile maps, for example, for your uh, game uh, production two course, you're doing a, maybe a tile map, then you may want to use something like this. They're in the book for the program, uh, which is SDL Game Development. Near the back, they actually tell you how to do a tile map loader. So it'll take the tile map from this program and it, it exports it as an XML document and it shows you how to import it and use the tile map to kind of position the tiles on the screen, okay? It tells you all about, the, there's a whole tutorial about it inside the book, okay? I probably won't have enough time to talk about that um, myself, only because of time frames, because this isn't really a 2D animation course or 2D drawing course, you know? So I probably won't cover it, but this is a pretty good resource for you guys if you want to show tiles that are really nicely on the screen. Okay. Okay. So that's that part. Um, each tile in your map should have a cost value. We talked about that today uh, to pass through it. And each tile should also know which other tiles are connected. So you need to know, like, what are my neighbor tiles? What's the tile above me, below me, to the right, to the left? Is there even a tile there or is, am I at the edge of the map? Right? Determine a starting tile some start node, and an ending tile, some goal node. Set these points to challenge the seeker. The key word here is challenge the seeker to determine the shortest path. So don't put them next to each other. That will not suffice. That will not meet criteria, right? Make sure that they're, you know, the positions of these things are different places, okay? Um, use a pathfinding algorithm of your choice. You can use Dijkstra, A star, or other to allow the seeker to find the shortest path to the ending tile. You may use any heuristic that works best for your simulation. So if you use A star and you want to use, from a heuristic perspective, you know, uh, Manhattan distance, you can do that. You can also use uh, Euclidean distance if, if you so choose. If you want to make a combination of both, because you think, you know, you want to tweak your algorithm, your heuristic, so it uses both, you know, both things, that's up to you. It's kind of weird, but okay. Now you're gonna move the seeker along the predetermined path to the ending tile. So somehow when you determine the length, you're gonna move there, right? Okay, eight, this is important. Your program should allow the starting tile to be different every time within reason. Provide two or three different starting points. Okay, so don't just start the simulation, it's the exact same thing every time, right? Maybe give me a few options, so show me where it can start. If it starts here, it does this. Um, and then provide the ability for the user to select them and restart the simulation. I should really do that with some kind of buttons. Show the total path cost and the UI label in the appropriate spot on the screen. What's the total path cost? I don't need all the minor path costs, like what is the heuristic cost and what is the distance. I don't need that. I see the total path cost in each of the tiles. Okay? Bonus. Randomly generate your map and obstacles, ensuring that there's at least one viable path for the seeker to find. Okay, guys, this is, I'm only giving you a bonus of five points for this, but this actually is quite challenging to do, right? Um, so think about Minecraft, what they do with Minecraft, right? In Minecraft, we use something called Perlin noise, and we take random numbers, and what Perlin noise does is it takes random numbers and it clumps them together. It clumps them together in biomes, and these little in kind of a similar topology, if you will, right? And it doesn't just do it on 2D, it does it in 3D, right? Okay, I'm not asking you to do that. But what if you just like randomly splat stuff down? Like for example, mountains and uh, I don't know, deserts and other weird tiles, right? It'll look messed up. It'll be like random symbols all over the place, right? There needs to be some kind of smoothing algorithm or something that you use, right? 
and to make it look nice. So we're talking, what we're talking about here is moving from just randomly generating stuff to procedurally uh, generating content or PCG, procedural content generation. That's like an AI section of its own, right? Which we haven't covered. So be careful, don't do crazy stuff. You may need to do a second pass that allows you to do one viable path, okay? Uh, bonus two, add an enemy that can defeat the seeker if it has line of sight. Again, line of sight, this is actually spelled wrong. Um, if the enemy seeks the seeker to follow them, and then if the enemy touches the seeker, game over, right? If, they, if he has line of sight. So how does line of sight work? You draw a ray from your uh, enemy, and it's always in front of the enemy, and if the ray intersects with the, se with the seeker, it has line of sight, and it starts chasing you, right? You could do it that way. Okay, so that's that. Um, add music and sound effects. This is an easy one. I think these two are, are kind of difficult to do, right, to get bonus. Add a start screen and an end screen. If you use my template, you'll get this for free. I'm giving you a start screen and an end screen today, right? And then add a scoring system that provides a score based on the path costs. I mean, some kind of make it basically gamify your simulation, right? Um, again, that, that's something that you can do fairly simply. Submission details are the same, a zip archive uh, of your project files, as well as some kind of short text document that includes the names and student IDs of the people that were, you worked in and some simple instructions on how, how do I use your simulation. Like what numbers do I press? If I press the G key, does it generate the grid? If I press the H key, does it show me the, you know, the something else? Like what do I do? If I press the F key, does it follow the path? Like how does your, how does your stuff work is, is what I'm saying. Questions around assignment two. This is due week nine, which is March 6th. And it sounds like a far away, far away time. It's not very far away at all. It's around the corner and you have no time. So once you're finished your assignment number one, hop into this one as soon as you can, even a little bit at a time, okay? Questions around assignment two? All right, let's move on. So yeah, so I want to talk about our structure a little bit. Um, if we go back to our, to our little um, application here that I've got, we're going to be talking about some stuff that we've changed this time around, okay? I'm going to draw it out for you. So right now, what we have is, we have a situation that looks like this, okay? So imagine this is the whiteboard. So I have this container, and the container is the window container, right? So let's draw the window. So this is like SDL window, right? And this is a container that's been, that gets created when I, from the game. So the SDL window container kind of is right here, right? It's a pointer to the SDL, um, to the structure, right? And I have another container that's inside of it that looks like this. Well, not look like this, but this is how it operates kind of, kind of, which is the SDL renderer. You guys should be somewhat familiar with this concept. So here's my SDL render. And the SDL render is the surface where we draw all of our, all of our sprites and textures, okay? And now what I've been doing so far is in my game, right? Every time I draw something, I'm drawing it in the, on the renderer surface. So I kind of draw an object, maybe I draw another object and something else. And then what I gotta do is update and draw each of the objects every frame. And when it comes down to it, when I need to reset my scene, I don't have a separate scene right now. I just, if I wanna reset this, like for your assignment number one, I have to like delete these, right? Completely, and then reset, re redo them, right? And this is okay for like three items, like three, four, five, 10, okay, no problem. But what about if I have 500? What if I have a 10,000? like particle systems, right? This would be like totally crazy to do, to do individual ones, manage each one individually. That's like completely inefficient to do, right? So we need to start thinking about other structures. And one thing we can do instead of this is we can create a logical container aside from the game. The game is, is kind of like a wrapper that wraps around all, around all this stuff. Like this is the game container, like way out here, right? So the game kind of wraps everything. It defines window and it defines my render and all that kind of stuff, right? And that's kind of sitting like way out here, right? 
but and this is actually where everything gets drawn to the game the render renderer lives inside the game and serves the window and then we kind of draw stuff in here on the renderer surface but what i really want to do is create a second another layer and i want to kind of make it draw something like this inside here right and this logical layer right what i want it to be called is the scene layer here's the scene so hear me out for a second before you say wait wait that's just more overhead it is however some advantages <clears throat> I can add different game objects to the scene right let's suppose I add a few of them and when I want to kill the scene right or kill the game objects I literally just have to kill the whole scene so the scene gets destroyed and all the game objects inside of it now every one of them every every if I have 50,000 game objects inside the scene container they all die too right However, I have to set up structures to do this. One thing I'd like to set up is a new structure, right? That's inside, that lives inside the scene. It kind of contains all the objects like this. And I'm going to call it display list. Again, this a name and the concept is not new, right? But uh, the idea behind it is something that I want you guys to think about. So I have this scene and inside the scene, I have a display list. OK? So here, so think about the, the power of this display list, right? That means when I want to update things and I want to draw things, I can update and draw the whole list, not just each individual item. Right now I'm doing this. M underscore P ship draw. M underscore P ship update. M underscore P target draw. M underscore P target update. It's completely inefficient and crazy. And if I had a long list of them, let's say if I had 50 targets and 30 ships or whatever, or something crazy, I'd have to update each one individually. That's nuts. That's crazy, right? So we need some kind of collection that allows it to help us do this, all right? Are you with me on this? You understand? Overhead, we're gonna, we're gonna create new structures. And I've done that here in this project. This, this structure already exists, okay? But we're gonna talk about this. Okay, furthermore, let's take it one step further. Furthermore, let's define what our game object looks like. So right now, we have our game object. So our game object kind of sits like this. So here's our game object. And my game object, right? Here's our game object. Our game object is a abstract superclass. We talked about that. Remember what abstract means? What's abstract? Who can answer that? Huh? One, one, virtual one virtual function. One pure virtual. Virtu whatever the function is equals zero, right? Okay, cool. But that's the definition for it. But what do we use it for? Let me continue. So I have my game object superclass, and I have my uh, a bunch of these little functions. I have three little functions, if you remember what they are. What are the three functions that I have in my game object that all game objects share? Remember? Draw, update, draw update. and clean. Those are the three. Draw, update, and clean. So draw, right? Update. And clean. So what I want to do, and these, these are tightly coupled, right? These things are part of my abstract superclass so that every uh, class that inherits from game object, they get draw, update, and clean, right? Remember what I said? Parent classes are leaner than children classes, right? Child classes will be fatter than this. It'll have this plus anything else I give it, okay? And this is okay, this structure. But sometimes I want to have this. I want to have things that I want to add to my display list. And there will be things that I don't want to display. Can you think about game objects that I don't want to or need to display, but are still part of my, my scene? Spawn points. That's a great example of that. Spawn points, checkpoints, um, triggers, invisible triggers of different kind in my scene. All those kind of things can be in my scene. There'll be game objects because they can have they'll have position, 
you know, they'll have all those things. They can collide. They might have a collider, as an example, but they may not be drawn, right? So instead of like not calling the draw function, that's one option. That's a, that's a solution. Just don't draw the, the draw, just call the draw function on them, right? I want them also to have a connection to the, uh, the stage or the scene, if you will. So what I want is a new class. Here's my new class. And we'll call this class display list or display object. We'll make the display list in a second. So there's display object. The display object is also going to be a, uh, an abstract superclass. Okay, and you're going to go, wait, wait. Now that's a lot of abstraction. And yes, it is. And if I spell abstract, how about if I spell abstract properly? Darn it. Sorry. It's going to be recorded, so just for posterity. People will go crazy if they see this. They'll be like, Tom can't spell. No, I, I just can't type. That's what it is. Okay. Um, so there's an abstract display object, and I'm just going to use a little point, uh, a little uh, line to indicate that uh, this little line here is going to point to this class right here. And it's like using a little bit of minor uh, UML. So this arrow usually means it's a child of this superclass. That's what the arrow means. Okay? So it's derived from display object has a special relationship. We can say that it is a game object. Yeah? This is per the um, object oriented rules, right? So we can say display object is a game object. And display object has a draw function, update function, and clean function. Has a. Is a and has a. Okay? I want to give display object a little bit more oomph, more stuff to that it can do. I want to make it a little fatter, just a little bit. I'm going to give it an internal mem data member, right, that's inside, not necessarily a function, a special function, but just a little data member. And what this little data member is going to do is it's going to know about its parent. Okay, so I want to know about what the parent data member is. I want to know, it's going to be a pointer to parent. Okay, so display objects will also know what, who their parents are. Right now, if I add a game object to the, to the game, it doesn't know anything. It doesn't know about other, other game objects. All it knows is about itself. It has no knowledge of anything else, right? I want to kind of give it a little bit of knowledge about its parent. It doesn't know about its children right now, but this display object should know about its parent. Okay, cool. So this is the first structure. The second structure I want to make is the, sta the, the scene. So the scene, I'm going to park it over here, is my scene class. So here's my scene. And the scene is also going to be abstract. You're going to say, whoa. Now that that's really abstraction. Like, why would I need all that stuff? I mean, do you need it? I think it's good from a logical perspective to use something like this. But you know, it's up to you. You may simplify some of this stuff. But this also will point to my game object superclass. Let's make this little arrow. I know it's not straight, but whatever. So this is going to be a little arrow that points to my uh, game object. This means that scene is a game object as well. It's not a display object. It's a game object, right? It's a container more than anything else, right? And the scene is going to have some special functions, two special functions, right? One, which is going to be kind of a handle input function, handle input, right? And this handle input function, I'm just putting it on two lines so I can fit it in here. Handle input. My handle input function, and I'm also going to have another function that all scenes will have. And I'm just following kind of like the Unity way of doing things where I have something called start. And what start is, what the? Ah. Okay, there we go. Here's start. So start is where I'm going to do all my initialization. Okay? In my scene, if that makes sense.
are you good with this so far, this structure? So again, I have my game object, I have my scene. And in my game object, what I want to have, my scene, I want to have these methods, right? I'm also going to have a method that I can add children. So this is kind of not a lifecycle method. It's just a method that I can do. It's going to be public, right? And I'm going to be able to add child. Here's add child. And what add child will do, right? What add child will do will take a display object, right? So it'll take one of these display objects and it'll add it to the display list. Because remember what I said? My scene is also going to have a data member called display list. Okay? Display list. So why am I talking about all this structure stuff? Why don't I just show you the code? Well, because sometimes what happens is when I show people code, they're like, wait, where did that come from? What the heck is this? How does it work? Here's how it works. This is what I made. So questions around this. I have my scene. I have my game object. It is a game object. The scene is a game object. You're like, wait, why is the scene a game object? Why not just make it something else? Well, think about what I can do if I can make it a game object. If my scene is a game object, that means it has a, its own draw, update, and clean method. By, by default, it has those things, right? That means I can draw and update my entire scene, okay? And on top of drawing and update the scene, I can also move it around. If I wanna make a scene transition where the whole scene comes in, right? I can make it so that all the objects, when each of the, the scene moves, it can notify its entire display list, right? To move to. So if the scene moves, if, if the scene changes position, right? I can say that, hey, all you display objects, you're going to move position too. You're going to move to position in world space that's going to match the scene. If I want to do screen shape, I want to move the whole, sh the whole screen up and down. I can do that. Instead of moving each individual object, I can move the scene up and down, right? And all the objects can follow it if I want to, right? To create a screen shake, a screen shake effect, OK? So there's other reasons why I want this. Uh, this hasn't been set up yet, but we will. All right, so questions around this new structure that I'm going to use. That's what I'm going to be doing now. OK, let's take a look at the code. So again, if you notice here in my source files, I have a scene class. Here's my scene class. Let's go to header. So my scene class is exactly what I told you it's going to be. It's, it's of type game object, right? One thing it has is it uses friend display object. So why does it use friend? What does friend mean? All the public members are accessible. OK, that's one thing, all the public members. What else? What else is good with friend? I, it's not part of the class. I'm not using an include, but I have access to create one if I want to. If I want to create or instantiate something of type display object, I can do that without including a, uh, um, an include statement. Why is this good? Because guess what? Since my scene is a game object and I'm trying to add child display objects, um, it could create a cyclical reference, right? So I don't want that and I'm using friend instead. So I can have access to the display object but not create a cyclic reference. Make sense? Okay. And I have some structures. My add child, remove child, remove all children. I want to remove all of them. And number of children. When I move from one scene to the other, I can remove all the children in my display list, right? And this would clean them up. OK, so that's what the scene class does. I also have this enumeration. And what I'm going to do um, next week, I'm going to do some template improvement. And we're going to move this scene state, uh, this enumeration out. Right now, if you notice, uh, my template's kind of taken a step back in terms of organization. Notice I, have, I don't have a manager's filter. I don't have an enums filter. I'm going to put all that back for you guys next week. So we'll have a little bit of template improvement again. OK? So that's the scene class. And the scene class has a scene state enum built into it. Right now, I've only defined three states, start scene, play scene, and end scene. And I also have this state called no scene. When the game starts, it's going to start with no scene. There's no scene yet, right? And then I'm going to move it from no scene to start scene. Now, I got a question today saying, why am I doing this? And then you'll see. 
So, scene class. Okay, how does it switch from one scene to the other scene? I mean, yeah, okay, I'm defining scenes. Let's take a look at my scenes that I have so far. So I have my start scene. So here's my start scene. My start scene is a scene, is a scene. A scene is a game object, so therefore my start scene is a game object, right? It has that relationship because it follows the inheritance hierarchy, right? The top of the class is game object. Underneath the game object is a scene, and under the scene itself is this start scene. Start scene inherits from scene, okay? Notice it also inherits draw, update, clean, handle events, and start, right? All these things are part of every scene. I've also included some things that I've commented out. I have a couple labels that I've commented them out. Let's uncomment those labels and see what they give to us. So I've created a new label class. Remember I said in your assignment two, I said I want you guys to show me the value in a label. Well, there wasn't a label until now. I've made a label class for you, all right? So I wanna go here, I wanna to go to my start function. So go to start. In start, I've commented this stuff out. I want you to comment back in. And this is, you're gonna see both the start, like two labels, start label and an instruction label, okay? I create them here, but I need to update them. Let's go to the uh, draw function. Right now, my labels, although the display objects, are not using the display list update function. I'm not gonna do that yet. Next week, I'll make the display list work with you guys. So here's my draw, and what I'm doing is I'm drawing my labels, and then I'm drawing my ship. And you can see that this is bad. If I had like lots of stuff to draw, buttons, labels, ships, targets, tiles, it'd be crazy, right? Too many to draw. And the same thing goes with uh, cleaning. I wanna clean my start label, I wanna clean my instructions label, lots of work to do, right? And update works the same way. If I had some kind of update that I would do, I'd update the start label, if I had to move it around or the ship or whatever, like tons of work to do. So if I run this now, now that I've uncommented those things, I'm gonna find that it's slightly different than before. One day when it builds, it takes, it's gonna take a second to build because of this thing. Yay, look, here's a start label, it says start scene. And press one to play. This font that I've decided to use is called Doc51. It's uh, kind of an example font that I've been using for a while. However, you can use other fonts that you want. Any true type font you want will come up, all right? So if I go to Solution Explorer and I right click on my, on my template, my solution, and go to Open File Folder and Explorer, and if I go to Assets, you can see that I have a bunch of fonts. Consolas, Doc51, and Lazy.2Type font, right? You can include other fonts in here. Let's say, for example, you wanted Helvetica, and you could get a Helvetica font or something else that looks really, really cool. You can put those fonts in here, and then as long as you call the first name, so I'm calling Consolas, let's say, then it will change the font to load that font set, that, those glyphs, as opposed to Doc51. Let me show you how that works. So again, if I go back to start, in my start in my start scene and instead of doc 51 I chose to use consolas as long as the font is called consolas like this then you can see that if I change both of them or one of them and if I press play you're gonna see that it's a different font that comes up now okay switch it up one thing to note is labels are not like text in a word document these things are they've converted each of the glyphs of the font into pixels. So this is a rasterized version of the text that I've entered. I've created my text, let's say start scene, and I've converted it into textures. That's what I'm doing here. So these are all textures, okay? So just images. If I, one thing I wanna do is I wanna enable me to, uh, enable the ability for me to go to the next scene. So I, I wanna comment out in the handle events function handle event, I want to comment out my, or uncomment, sorry, my um, one and two buttons. However, there is a problem right now in my uh, play scene. Let's go to my play scene. So Solution Explorer, I'm going to go to my play scene.cpp. Please go there. I'm going to direct you to where how to fix the problem. So scroll down 
until you get to about or line 160 on comment 160 and just put the comment header on line 161. I just uncommented the I commented out the wrong thing. Okay? If you run it now, you should be able to move from one scene to the other. Like I talked about. So this is scene one or start scene. If I press one, it goes to the play scene. If I press two, it goes to the end scene. If I press one again, it goes back to the play scene. One again, it goes back to the start scene. You can navigate between one scene and the other with your keys. All right? Remember that each scene, what it does is it has game objects associated with it. It'll add stuff, and then you can remove stuff. If I go one, you can see that I got this, this little window or whatever. I can, there's buttons here and some kind of collapsible menu as well as a help menu that'll pop up, and then a file menu with exit, which actually exit the program. How do I do that? Well, I'm giving you a new tool to use for assignment number two called I am GUI. I am GUI, or dear I am GUI is what it's called. And if you look at your Blackboard, under labs, under week five, I've given you a couple links. One, autonomous agents can help you with your assignment number one if you haven't done some of it. But the other one I'm giving you is dear I am GUI. Let's take a look at dear I am GUI for a second. So if I control click, it shows this. It's a GitHub branch, and this is the actual I am GUI project. What I am GUI does is it's a community supported UI. And guys, this is every type of user interface widget you can possibly think of is included in I am GUI. Buttons, labels, checkboxes, combo boxes, um, all kinds of crazy stuff. Windows. You can drag and drop in I am GUI. You can do a bunch of things, calculations and images and everything. If you actually scroll down here, it shows you so many different types of things that it can do. This is kind of like the kitchen sink of user interface items. So why am I giving you all this stuff? Because it'd be great to have access to these windows. So when you do things like, I want to change values in real time, you know, I don't want to be able to recompile my code. So I change a value, stop my, my, I stop my code, stop my, stop my execution, go change the value, recompile. Okay, that didn't work. Let's try it again. Stop my, stop my application, change the value, recompile my application, see if it works. That, you know, recompiling and rebuilding, compile and build every single time, that eats away your day. Imagine you being a, a, a programmer like that. Half of your day is compiling and building, right? It's crazy, right? So this stops some of that because you can do some tests. And once you're fi finished doing your tests, um, then you can modify the variables later. You can even save your configurations um, out to, um, uh, to files and so on, which is very interesting. For people who are non-programmers, let's suppose you're making um, some kind of scene and you want your, your, as a programmer, you've created your scene, but you want your artists to, or le level, level designers to lay out your scene, maybe through some kind of drag and drop system. You can make that happen with I am GUI, save the positions, save it to a file, like an XML file or, or, or a JSON file, and then load it back later. You can give them dials and different kinds of sliders to increase the speed, increase gravity, do all kinds of stuff for gameplay, and this is a great tool. I am GUI is used in research when we create stuff, applications with research, uh, in 3D, and across different platforms. For even Unity, the commercial game engine uses I am GUI in some places. All right, so really cool. Highly recommend that we, we use it, and that's why I've given it to you. It's been included in your project. So it took a little bit of, to, of effort to get this done, but it's not that bad. So how does it work? So let's go back to my placing.h now. So I go to Solution Explorer, placing.h. Placing.h has a couple of different things. One, it inherits from scene. Two, I have a ship that's not being drawn right now. Okay, I have a ship that's not being drawn right now. I'm going to draw it later. And if I go further down, you can see that um, I have some I am GUI functions. Please do not delete these functions. 
all right, in, in your uh, play scene. You can certainly turn off the UI if you don't want to use it, but if you kill these functions, you have to do some work and get rid of it. If you're going to do that, you might as well just delete the scene and start a new one, okay, because there's a lot of uh, stuff in here that you may not need. I have some IM GUI menu variables like exit, uh, exit app, I want to display my about, or display the entire UI, okay? That's what these things do. They're like little booleans that I've put together. What is IM GUI key map? Let's take a look at that. So I've go to definition. IM GUI key map literally does a mapping between SDL's key inputs as well as IM GUI's inputs. So if IM GUI needs to receive a tab, right? And um, if IM GUI needs to receive a left arrow up or down or a page up or anything like that, then we need to pass it the, the corresponding uh, key enumeration from SDL. That's what this does. Okay, that's what this key mapping stuff is. Further down, I have IM GUI's style. And what IM GUI is right now is that gray window. You can change any of these colors. That's what these things are. So if you want to change your UI so it's blue or dark or something else, you can certainly go through here and change individual objects, like for example, the frame background or the title bar or anything else that you want. Okay, I've kind of set some basic colors for you, but you can certainly go in there and change them to other things. Okay, if you're interested. Okay. Notice also that my alpha is at 0.8. It's not 100% alpha. I can change this alpha value to whatever I want. Okay. I scroll down, you can see that I have another thing called um, update UI, right? And I set up I am GUI this way. Let us uncomment line 93. If I uncomment line 93, you're going to see the kitchen sink. And I mean, I'm not meaning a real kitchen sink. I mean like every control you can possibly think of all in one window. Here it is. So if I want to get an example of, hey, what does, if I go to widgets, what does a button look like? Let's go to basic widgets. These are different kinds of buttons. Here's a radio button. This is how they work. Here's what a pull down menu might look like. Pull down, right? You know, there might be other things here. Here's, here's some sliders, some sliders, and so on. There's like lots of basic things here. It also handles things like trees. So I have different kinds of trees, child one, child two, right? I have other things in here like collapsible headers, bullets, what bullets look like, text, combo boxes, images. So I want to put an image in place, I can do that. And many, many other things to customize your user interface. Okay? They even allow you to do drag and drop. Right? So I can drag and drop from one place to the other. Okay? Pretty good. Right? Different kinds of data types, right, that you can use. So I can drag, uh, you know, these things around, milliseconds, integers, and so on, right? Different kinds of sliders. It shows you everything how to do in, in this thing, right? So I'm not going to go into all these details, but there's a ton of things you can learn how to do here. Um, let's, let's stop this. If you don't want to see this anymore, you just comment it out. And if I want to see the code behind it, I can go to my Solution Explorer, I can click on I am GUI, and I can look at I am GUI demo. Now, it's going to be a bit of a warning. It says, hey, if you think that you're, you want to delete this I am GUI demo, this is the, the developers putting this warning there for you. Don't do it. Wait. Because guess what? You might need something. And you can just literally copy and paste. So if I want to do something like, well, I want to show some kind of you know, um, uh, a user guide or a, a bulleted text. This is what bulleted text looks like. I can literally just copy paste bullet text and then it'll work in my, in my IM GUI, all right? And there's a bunch of stuff in here that you can look at and, and if I want to find a button, so I can say control F, I want to find a button, all right? What, is, what do buttons look like, you know, kind of thing. So I can see what buttons look like. Here's a button. Buttons literally like this, I am GUI button and whatever the button label is. That's it. That's how fast a button is to me. And not only this, 
But if you want to do something in IAM GUI and you don't know what to do, even if you look at this file, it's too complex for you, you can always search it up on Google and it has tons of support. There are a, a, a bunch of examples here to create your U, UI. All right, so I spent enough time talking about IAM GUI, but why? Why am I going to do that? Take a look at your assignment to requirements. It says, start things in different positions, right? You may have to test certain things as well, right? And instead of compiling and building over and over again, it can make it easier. I'm just going to turn, just gonna, I'm just going to shut the door here because it's driving me crazy. All right. <laughs> Any questions about IAM GUI? IAM GUI stands for Immediate Mode Graphic User Interface. And what it does is it updates every frame. OK? That's what it does. So, so if you notice in scene placing.cpp, I have some examples. I have a menu bar. And I have a file menu and a menu item that says exit that actually exits the app. Help actually brings up this little help menu that shows me about Pathfinding Simulator, and it shows me as the author, you can certainly switch my name with yours when you make your assignment too, okay? Nothing wrong with that. Plus, I've given you some examples of some buttons, some of them on the same line. If you wanna make buttons that are next to each other, you can use same line to do that, okay? And even an example of a slider float, right? Which allows me to slide between two values, let's say between 0.1 and 10, with an increment of 0.1. <coughs> as an example. It'll do that. But you need to pass in a reference to the floating point number you want to modify. That's how it works. And other things, collapsible menus and blah, blah. All right, questions around I am GUI, anything like that, your user interface that I've given you. Okay, part two. That was part one. Part two, I want to make tiles. I want to use tiles. We talked about pathfinding today, and I talked about waypoints and nodes. I'm going to use a grid and tile system. I've already created a tile for you, right? So let's take a look at what that looks like. Actually, you know what? Before I get in there, how, how about this? How do I switch between scenes? <laughs> That's the one thing I didn't tell you how to do. Let's talk about finite state machine before we get into tiles. That might be better. So if you look at your game.cpp here, that might be a pla good place to start. All right, let me draw some stuff out here. So this is our scene and everything else. Yay, let's get delete this one. So how does a finite state machine work? First of all, what is a finite state machine? Because we're going to be using it for different things. Well, I've actually, up on uh, Blackboard, you can see that I've put up something called state pattern. And we talked about this before, right? I said that... Back in the 90s, these people got together. They were called the Gang of Four. There was these, you know, kind of like expert programmers, I would say, in object-oriented programming. And they noticed that, hey, guess what? There's a lot of repetition here. We've, we're continuing to build the same patterns in our coding over and over again. We build some kind of observer system where we can do some event handling. You know, we're doing other things. And one of the patterns that they found that was very common was the state pattern. So there's 23 design patterns. What uh, the author of this book has done, this book here, which is called, and if I go back to the, uh, the book, this is called Game Programming Patterns. Remember, I think I've talked about this with you before. I highly recommend you take a read, right? Um, it's fully online for the most part. Robert Nystrom's uh, kind of written this book. And if I go back to where I was, it kind of talks about state. And what state is, is it allows us to move from one state to the other state. A good example of some states are behavioral states. Like you have a zombie, as an example, in a video game, and he is idle. He's, uh, he's clacking his teeth. He's sitting in the, in the middle of a field. He doesn't see anybody, and maybe he's even like very still. Idle state. And then he smells a human. And when he smells the human, maybe he has line of sight, he sees the human, then he starts going towards the human, he starts walking and, and you know, with his arms out. Then he moves from idle state 
into walk state or stumble state. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. These different states, there's two states. One is the locomotion part, and the other part is the animation part. So he's moving from being idle and having an idle animation to moving, move state, maybe a seek state, with a some kind of sh you know shambling animation. He's moving into that animation. Maybe the anim the zombie gets uh, hit, you know, by a gun. He gets hit by like a bullet, and so he you, we can see him get like uh, you know a hit state and stuff and stuff like that. He can move from one state to the other state. So we can use it for animation. We can use it for behavior. We can use it for AI. I want to make a decision. I want to move left or right. I'm in left turn state. I'm going to go to right turn state. I'm into arrival state. I'm in seek state. I'm in flee state, right? I can also use it for moving from one scene to the other. I'm in the start scene state. I want to move to the play scene state. I want to move from the play scene to the end scene state, right? State machine. How do we implement the state machine? Well, I'm just going to draw this out. So we have state, the yes, idea of state. So let's, let's just draw some boxes. So here's a state. We're in this state right now. And this is, let's say, the current state. So the current state, it points to some enumeration. All right? In our case, our enumerations are going to be like this. We're going to have the you know, start scene. And then we're going to have um, you know, the play scene. And we're going to have the end scene. OK, so let's say a few states. Could be one of those. All right. So whatever the current state is, it's going to be one of these things. Let's start off for now with the start scene. OK, let's suppose that the first scene is the start scene. So that's the first state. OK. And my current state is a pointer to the scene. OK, that's what it is. OK. And then some trigger triggers me to go from one scene, one scene to the other scene. I want to call something like change scene state. So let's say there's another thing that says change scene state, all right? And we'll make this as, a, as some kind of function. So this is my change scene state function. And what I want to do is I want to pass in some kind of new state. All right, so that's what I want to do. So there's new state. Whatever the new state is, right, that's what I want to pass in. Well, and what I want to do is when I pass in a new state, it's going to compare the new state compared to the current state. So let's say I want to move from start to play. It's going to say, hey, what, scene, what state am I in? I'm in start state. OK, cool. I want to move to the new state, play state, right? Well, what I want to do is I want to switch. I'm going to have a switch case, so some kind of switch on new state, whatever that new state is. It's not going to quite look like this. And in my new state, I'm going to draw this out for a second. I'm going to have a couple of cases. I'm going to have, if the case that it's a uh, start state, right? Then do something. In case it's a play scene state, then do something else, right? And then finally, in case it's a, I don't know, end scene, I don't know, finish the game or do something else, do another thing. Okay, so that's what kind of like what the um, state machine does. It switches from one state. Think about it as a simple switch case that switches from one state to the other state. Okay, that's what it does. So let's just put that into play. That's your pseudocode. So it says, hey, whatever the new state is, Instantiate what you need to instantiate and do something else. And then what it does, let's suppose I want to move from start scene to play scene. All I'm going to do is I'm going to wipe out, I'm going to wipe out the, oops. Let's 
Let's move it back here. I'm going to erase the connection that I have, right, between my uh, play scene and I'm going to create, I'm just move my, oops, that's the wrong line. I want to move my, uh, uh, move my state to point at the play scene now. So I move from start scene to play scene. That's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to, just, I'm just pointing to the new state. When I point to this new state, my change scene state is going to be activated and I'm going to do my play scene and my start scene is going to be wiped out. That's what's going to happen in my code. Okay, does that make sense? So that's the structure I'm going to follow. So let's see it in code. So in here, I'm going to start off with my start. In my start, I define myself as having no scene. So my current scene state has no scene attached to it. This is the first time when I first run this code, right? Then I want to change scene state to my start scene. Okay, change scene state, let's go there. Okay, I check, is my new state, if it's not equal to my current state, then let's change something. Otherwise, this guard will prevent anything by accident happening where I switch the scene by accident, okay? Like I set it to, this, to itself and it tries to instantiate itself again, like a reset, okay? However, if my current scene is not equal to no scene, so this is not the first time around. Right now, it is the first time around. If it's not the first time around, well, we skip this. We skip this this time around. So the first time we don't do this. Why do I want to do this? Because this cleans all of my uh, structures, my current scene itself. The font manager instance, I clean up the fonts. And the texture manager, I clean up all those things, right? Which means it deletes everything. It deletes everything from those, th those uh, structures, right? If those structures don't exist and I never created anything, it's going to give me an error, right? I'm trying to delete something that doesn't exist. So I haven't gone here first. So I, I avoid it. Now, there's other ways of not doing this, but I've just put this guard in here for now. Then <clears throat> it says, hey, if now my current state is equal to my new state. So my current state now is equal to the start scene. Since it is, switch it. If this is the case, instantiate a new object called start scene, allocate memory on the heap, right? And point my current scene pointer to that new memory location, okay? Then you're in my start scene, I press the one button and I wanna to go to my play scene or I press a, a play button, right? Guess what? I come back to here, new state. Is my new state not equal to my current state? Yes, that's true, it's not. Cool. Have I been here before? Yes, I have. Clean everything up. Good, now my current state is equal to my new state, but now my new state is the play scene, so I want to instantiate that. Excellent. So how does this work in terms of updating and stuff? Well, if I go to my draw function or my render, my render function now does this. It only draws my current scene. I don't know what my current scene is. There's no knowledge of what my current scene is. It's going to point to one of the scenes, but I don't know which one. It doesn't matter because each scene is a scene. Each, each start scene, play scene, end scene, they're all scenes. So they all have a draw, update, and clean function. So I can call them. Right? I don't know which one I'm, I'm updating, but I'm updating one. And I'm updating all the things that are inside of my current scene as well. So this abstraction, I pull back from my, um, you know, from doing it directly in game. What it allows me to do is swap scenes out. I can have one scene in, draw it, and then swap it out and draw something else. Okay? And that's what's happening here when I press play. When I press play, you can see I have my first scene that, that loads. The scene that's loaded is the start scene. Okay, if I press the one button, right, you can see it cleans up this, the scene, and then it play scene is playing. Okay, and if I press the two button, you can see that it cleans that up again, and now the end scene is activated, and so on. Okay, are we good? Here's what I want to do now. I want to talk about tile and grid. One of the things we can do with AI, we talked about this morning in lecture, is have a tile and grid system. 
and I've created a little tile for you, okay? Let me explain what this is. If you go to game objects, there is a tile.h. Let's look at that. Tile.h has some tile states, open, close, start, goal, and undefined. And it also has knowledge of neighbors, that neighbor above the tile, to the right, down, and left, because each tile should understand what the tile next to it is, in this case. So they're smart tiles, they're not dumb tiles. So when I put a tile down, and if it's next to a goal, it's going to know what the distance between that tile is and the goal tile, whatever it is. We're going to program all this next week, right? OK, cool. So we have all this stuff. And if you notice, we have a constructor that takes a position and a grid position. So this is world position. This should actually be called world position. Let's name it. Let's rename it. I'm going to um, refactor, rename. We'll call this world position. So this is world position, and this is grid position. OK. Why do I need both? World position is physically the, the pixels location that I want to put it in. For example, 20 on the x-axis and 20 on the y-axis. That's the pixel position of my tile. My tile is actually an image. That's what I've used. Again, you could think of different ways of doing this. But if I look at my folder in File Explorer, under Assets, under Textures, I have a tile texture, which is literally like just a PNG with a border on it. That's all it is. Why was this easier? Let me explain this for a second. I'm going to bring this up so you can see it. This was easier than actually drawing it for a couple reasons. One, well, the border. My border for my tile is actually bigger than normal. In SDL, there is no borders. There are no borders. I can't say border width 5. I can't do that, right? What I can do is draw multiple images. I can make a border of one, right? And then draw another one inside of the other one. So two, two rectangles. And the second rectangle is going to have a border of one. Then I'm going to draw the third rectangle inside the other rectangle. And that will be a border length of one. Then I'll have a border width of three. Guys, that's like crazy inefficient, right? I don't want that to happen, right? So I'm just drawing this for now. It's a texture, but you know what? If I draw something in SDL, it becomes a texture anyway. Everything in SDL is a texture at the end of the day, right? So I might as well make it prepare it like this. Touch your tile. So then the tiles are all game objects. If the tile is a game object, this is what the tile looks like, remember? It has some knowledge. It also has, so I have the ability to get the neighbors or set its own neighbors. I'm going to be doing this next week. I can also set the tile state. For example, there's going to be a few different tile states. If the tile is open, that means I can travel into it. If it's closed, for whatever reason, maybe it's not accessible. Let's say it's something, there's a block there. Or maybe I've already gone there before. If I've already gone there before, I want to close off that tile, right? Make sense? Open and closed. Then I might have the start state if I'm in the start tile or the goal. What if there is no tile? For example, maybe I want to set that if I'm on the border and I'm looking for the tile above this one, but there is no tile above it, I can set the tile above it even though there's nothing there from a pointer perspective, I can still set up its uh, neighbor tile to be undefined. Make sense? All right, so that's this. Um, I also can set and get a value for the tile itself. Like, I can calculate a value. And there's other functions here we're going to handle next week. One thing to note is that in the tile.cpp, I literally draw the tile out. So here's the tile. Right? And I get the width and height of the tile. And by default, all tiles are open. That's what I'm doing here. OK. Exercise. I want to show one of the tiles right now in my play scene dot, uh, CPP. My play scene. I want to show a tile. And I want to show the ship on top of the tile. How do I do this? OK, let's do it. So I'm going to go to my play scene. 
Here's my placing.h. And right now, I, I need to include the tile.h. So I can include it under game objects. So include tile.h. And then in my game objects, let's make some tile and oh, grid uh, members, we'll call them. This will be one tile. I'll make, I'll make it called M underscore P tile. That's what I'll call it. I'm, I'll rename this ship to M underscore P ship just to be, keep the same. So I got a tile and a ship. Right? But now I've just declared them, but I haven't done anything with them. I need to instantiate them. So I'm going to do that in the start function. So in the start function, go to definition. I'm going to instantiate those two things. I'm going to say m underscore p ship. That's equal to a new ship. But for tile, uh, and then I'm going to add child. I'm going to add my ship to the display list. Right? So later on, we're going to get used to doing this. I'm also going to set up the location of the ship. So set position to some GLM vec2. This is dying for a rewrite. Um, and the position is going to be like, I don't know, something like 400 and 200. So something like a little bit up from the middle of the, of the screen. So that's the ship. So instantiate ship and add it to the display list, which we're not using yet. And then I'm going to instantiate a single tile and add it to the display list as well. OK, so how does that work? M underscore P tile is equal to new tile. but I'm not going to add a set position here. I'm going to do it here in the tile. Why? I need both a world position and a grid position. So the world position is a new GLM. Let's just make it like this for now. GLM VEC2. And also another GLM VEC2. So two VEC2s for world position and grid position. So what is world position? X and Y coordinates. Grid position, I'm going to make a grid. And I, know, I want to know which column and which row it's in. I want to know about the grid, the grid itself. All right? Each grid tile should tell me, it should know itself, know exactly where it is inside the, the grid system. OK, which, which one it is. All right, so I'm not going to update this right now. I'm going to keep it 0, 0. That's what this does. But this one. I want to update it. Let's put the tile for now in the same location as the, uh, as the ship. So I'm just going to take this part. So they're going to be on top of each other. And I want to add child this tile. OK, so that's what this does. Now I want to update these things and draw them. So let's go to draw. And in my draw scene, I'm going to do the tile first, M underscore P tile, right? Draw. And M underscore P uh, ship, draw. So I'm going to draw those two things. In update, if I had to do this, I don't have to, but I'm, I'm underscore P tile. I'm going to update. I, there's nothing to update with my tile, but I'm going to show you what I would do. Update. And the same, same thing with the ship. All right, so I update the tile and the ship. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clean these ones too. I'm going to clean them up. When I'm done, I'm going to clean, oh, clean the tile. And I'm going to clean up the ship. OK, so that's the clean function. Does that make sense? All right, cool. So I've done update and clean and everything else. I should be able to see these things. Let's just run it and see what happens. 
So if I did everything correctly, I've instantiated the objects, and then they'll appear in my second scene. So remember, my play scene is where I want them. I've got my start scene that's going to load first. I'm going to press the one button for now. It's going to go to my play scene. And yeah, that was weird. Why did it happen? Because there's some, probably some code in the update of my ship to make it go. Right? So let's just comment, let's just comment this out. I really don't need to, for them to move right now anyway. I just wanted to put it there as an example. So again, let's run that again. So again, if I press one, I go to the new scene and you can see that the tile is exactly on where the ship is. Okay, how the heck did I decide the size of my tiles? Because I, I decided my size of my tile is going to be 40 by 40, right? And if you notice, in my Solution Explorer, there's a new construct under my header file called config.h. Config.h, I'm just going to erase this part, the static mine. Um, config.h, it, it kind of does this. What's the width and height of my screen? I have that available to me now. And I have my row number and column number. And I have a tile size of 40. How did I come up with this tile size of 40? Well, I kind of thought of it like this. Imagine if I have a, um, I have my width is 800. So I take 800 and I divide that by, let's say, a standard tile size of, I don't know, 32, which is kind of a standard tile size, 32, 16. Well, that's cool. It works for my width. I mean, I can have 25 tiles across, right? So 32 by 32 by 32. 25 tiles across on the x-axis. What about on the y-axis? Does it work for the y? 600 divided by 32, uh, not really. I get 18.75 tiles. So I get like 18 tiles and three quarters. That means a quarter tile on the bottom of my screen is gonna be like cut off. That doesn't look good. I don't want that, right? So I want tiles that are all the same and they're all on the screen for now. So I found that when you look at some other numbers, 40 seems to be a reasonable size because if I take 800 and divide it by 40, then I'm going to get 20, as you see here. And then if I do the 600 divided by 40, I'm going to get 15, right? So 40 seems to be okay for what we're doing. I could have also used 20, which would have made the tile size um, double the number of tiles on the, on the, X, on the X axis and the Y axis. However, then the labels are too small for us to see. That's why I found 40 is the right size. Okay? So what I want to do now is I don't want to just show one tile. I want to show a whole grid of tiles. All right? I want to fill up my screen with tiles. So I want to use a grid. In my mind, a grid should be some kind of array or collection. I'm going to use a standard vector to do this. All right, so again, I'm going to go back to my placing.h. And under my tile and grid members, let's get rid of my tile. I don't want a tile anymore. A single tile won't do, right? And I'll let the error be there for now. I'll fix it in a second. I want to make a new tile, which uses a standard vector, or a new grid of tiles, a new grid of tiles that I'm going to call m underscore p grid. It's a grid of tile pointers. Does it make sense? I'm using a standard vector collection. That's what I'm doing. So it's going to be like an enhanced array. It's going to be one dimensional, which means it's going to go from zero to whatever. Okay? And it's going to be dynamically allocated. I could make it an array instead of a tile, instead of a vector, but I find a vector is just a little bit more convenient. Okay, cool. So this is my vector. I need to instantiate it. And I also need to build it. So I'm going to have another function called uh, m underscore build grid. My build grid function, which is going to return void. And my build grid function is going to build my vector and add tiles to it. Let's implement this function. I'm also going to go to definition. And let's start doing it. I want to move this from here. I want to move it over here just from an organizational perspective. So it's like where pathfinding and steering functions are. Let's leave all the IAM GUI functions alone, guys. All right. So how does this work? I want to say that M underscore P grid, right, is equal to what? 
a standard vector of type tile pointer. You need to do this first. So what this does is it instantiates a structure of type vector tile pointer. If you don't do this, this part, there is no structure. There's no container. Just declaring it is not enough. We have to call its constructor function, right? Which is what I'm doing here. Okay. Now that I have, now that I have a uh, a grid, right? It's it's now empty. I want to add to it, so I'm going to have um, a couple of nested for loops to do this. So I'm going to use for i, and we're going to start off with column, and I'm going to use my config. I'm going to say config. And then column number, so column number, right? And inside that, should, be, should I do column or row? Maybe I'll do row first. So let's do row first. So we'll say instead of column, we'll call this row. And yes, there's different ways I could have done this. But there we go, row number. I'll do the same thing again. So I'll say 4i. Four, four and now we'll do the column. Column, and this will be config column number. All right, so nested loop, right? Standard structure. I could have done this differently too. There's other ways of doing this, right? So row, column. Cool. So this is what I want to do. I want to create a new tile. All right, so I'm going to use auto keyword. I want to make a tile, which is equal to a new tile. And my new tile is going to take world position and grid position, each tile. Right? So let's just put some blanks in there for now. GLM vec2. I don't know what the position is for here. And you know what? A GLM vec2 from my, um, my grid position. I want to do this. And then what I want to do is I want to add my tile to my, my display list. So I'll say add child tile. And I also want to add the tile to the grid. M underscore P grid dot pushback tile, right? That adds the tile to the grid. However, I don't have these positions here. I need those positions. To prepare, I'm going to make a new, uh, a couple things. One I need to know is the offset. Remember what the tile is. The tile is a texture that's 40 by 40. All of my game objects by default are centered, which means it has a width of 20 and a height of 20. If I was to draw this thing in the top left corner of the screen, it would be mostly not drawn. It would be drawn off screen. That means I need to push it down and to the right. I need an offset. So I'm going to say auto offset. That is equal to my config tile size, right, times 0 0.5. Let's take this one step further, right? It'd be nice if I had a very small way of doing tile size. I don't want to keep saying tile size, tile size. So I'm going to say auto size is equal to this. Hear me out for a second. You'll see I'm just making this so I can make it easier for us to read. That's all, right? By the way, does anyone know what auto means? What is auto? How about Christina in the front? What's auto, Christina? Huh? It's actually using implicit typing instead of explicit typing. So instead of using the actual uh, data type, like int or float, like it shows there, what I can do instead is just use the keyword auto, and it'll assign the correct data type depending on the assignment. So because I'm assigning um, this integer of tile size, it's kind of saying, well, you know what? Size must be an integer then. Right? That's what it says. <coughs> One thing it's asking me to do is it's saying it can be const if you want to make it const. I think it's a good idea to make it const because I'm not going to change the tile size ever. Right? And my offset, that could be const too. I can kind of make that const. So I can say offset, so auto, con, auto or const auto. I can make that constant as well. All right? So now that I have my offset, which is 
half the size of the tab uh, times 0.5, I can put that in as the X coordinate. So I can say that I start off at offset. That's where I start printing my tiles out. I'm gonna fix this one in a second. So offset, offset. I wanna add in, remember this is like 20 by 20, right? And then I add my um, tile size multiplied by my, um, again, remember that it's, it's column row, column, right? And then I add my size multiplied by the row. Okay, so what this does is says, look, offset, start off, start off at 20, 20, add, remember this is um, order of operations, add my size, which is 40, times my row. My row starts off at zero, add nothing for the first one on the x-axis, right? However, when I come back here again, it's going to add 40. So it's going to continue to offset what, where my position is physically in the game world. Okay, how about my grid position? My grid position is going to be whatever column row it is. So I'm going to say that it's column row, right? So that's my grid position. So tile, this is my world position, and this is my grid position. Okay, now it should work. I should have everything I need to make this appear on my screen. This is my grid. I need to call build grid from my start function. So let's teleport to my start function. Hey, I gotta get rid of this. I don't have any more tile, single tiles like this anymore, right? And I wanna make my tiles happen first. I wanna build my grid first up here. So I'm gonna say, you know, build grid. So that builds the grid. Right now, I don't need an update grid function, but eventually I might. I might need an update grid function. But for now, I don't. I want to draw my grid. That could be another function I have, draw grid. And if I have these things, guys, update grid, build grid, draw grid, that's what it's dying for. A grid class, right? That houses all this stuff together, right? The grid class is going to derive from or extend the standard vector, right? It's going to be a standard vector of type tile. That's what it's going to be. That's what the grid class is going to be. But I'm going to extend that standard structure with build grid, with a build function, with a, a, a update function, and with other things. Okay? If this makes sense. So I don't want to do this. No more. I'm not updating a single tile. I'm not updating a bunch of tiles. So I'm going to draw all of them. So I'm going to say that let's use a for each, like a ranged for loop. And I'm going to use m underscore grid. I'm going to say the type is auto again. And the element, I'm going to call it just tile. So for every tile in tiles, that's how I should do it. The every tile in my grid, then I want to draw the tile. That's how it works. So this arranged for loop from, uh, as an example, for every tile and tile, for each loop. All right, so I want to take the same structure when I update them. If I had an update uh, function for the tiles, I would update them the same way. I don't need to update the tiles right now, so I'm not doing it. But that, this is the same thing that I would do. All right, cool. Let's see if it works. So I'm going to run this thing. And if I did everything right, then I should see a grid in the background in my start in my play scene. And I didn't do everything right. Oh, I forgot some stuff. Yeah, I did some cleaning. I did some, and I can look here and I can see that there's no more errors. I think let's try that again. I think they'll build this time. Cool. And yeah. Right? What do you think? Notice that my ship is not on the grid, right? Well, because I didn't say it was. I randomly put it somewhere, right? What I can do now is because I have a grid, I can choose a random location on the grid and I can put my ship there, right? Remember that the grid is an array of tiles, right? And I can choose a random spot on that array, a random spot, right? We'll do that next week. Cool. Okay, but what if I don't want to show this grid? This is just a debug grid, 
right? Well, going into my draw function again, I can just wrap my grid around this. I don't want to do it down here because I want to keep these separate, my UI. So I'm just going to check for this again. All right, so I'm going to check to see that if I am if I am displaying my user interface, then and only then do I want to see my grid. But if I'm not displaying it, I won't see my grid. It'll still be there. I just won't see it. All right, so if I run it now, press 1. And if I press escape, or sorry, the, uh, not escape, if I press the back tick character, I can turn all that off. So you, it's a debug mode again. I can you know, show and hide my grid. Okay. Right now, the ship doesn't appear there, but we will make it appear there in the grid, and it'll have to fit exactly inside each group's, group's uh, uh, in each tile, right? All right, questions around grid and tile. We kind of did this. This is the beginning structure for your assignment number two, and I'm going to put this up on GitHub so you have access to all this stuff. So again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add it to source control, git. I'm going to use the built-in published to GitHub uh, extension for Visual Studio 2019. It's going to point me to the, the correct uh, organization. I'm going to go to uh, George Brown. And it's going to be called Game 3001 in the Winter 2020 Semester Lesson 5D. Publish. I'm going to have to update it. The first commit that it's going to do, it's actually going to put up um, some of the stuff, but if you try to download this, this application, remember that it's also going to remove my bin folder and a bunch of other stuff. So let's just fix that problem. And again, the way I fix it is I'm going to go to my uh, solution templates. I'm going to go to open file in File Explorer, my folder in File Explorer. And I want this one. I'm just going to do some, some uh, command line magic where I'm just going to go to CD. Actually, I do it in Visual Studio Code. That might be easier. This Visual Studio Code is just a little editor that I'm using that I can just mod modify my uh, gitignore file. So it's just another little editor. I have a little gitignore file here. And what I want to do is I want to comment out my bin folder. Right. So I'm going to use the hashtag to comment it out. OK. And I want to comment out my debug folder. So these two things I definitely want. I don't want these things to be commented out. And if I press Save now, I'm going to have a bunch more changes. Notice I have 36 changes here that I can make. Let's go back to Visual Studio. So in my Team Explorer again, I'm going to go to Changes. You can see that I have all these. I'm adding, I'm adding back all the DLLs, right? And I'm going to say something like uh, added grid and tile to um, placing. Commit all. Home. Sync. Push. And when I do this, your GitHub repo is going to be completely handled. All right. So you can always go back here um, and. Um, and, and kind of uh, you know take a look at this. Also, notice that there's the link for the GitHub repo right here. So if I click on the link, it'll take me there. Here it is. And you can see that I've got two commits for now. Are we good? This is wrong. Let's change our readme file. So this is not lesson six. This is lesson five. And we did a little earlier this, this year, 2020. And if I do this and I update my thing, I commit my changes, that means I'm one commit behind uh, the repo online. So locally, I'm one commit behind. I can just go to sync and pull, and it's going to pull that change that I made online locally. OK, cool. So you have that. Guys, that's all I have for today. Um, again, just a reminder, tomorrow assignment one is due tomorrow night at midnight. You must be able to be in a, you must be in a team or a group in order for you to even see the assignments. So hopefully you've signed up for groups right now. If you're still part of this class, like you're in this my lab and you need to be removed from a group or added to a group, please see me before you leave. I want to fix you. Okay? Otherwise, um, 
Good luck with your assignment, and I'll see you next week. Okay? I'll stop recording now. Not this one. This one.